Welcome to the Gate World Podcast. Welcome to episode 154 of the Gate World Podcast, a show where two nerds talk about all things Stargate. My name is Adam Barnard, and for this episode, I'm going to be joined once again by the lovely uh, Sarah Kehoe, who is a GateWorld contributor writing about watching Stargate Universe for the first time. On the last episode of the GateWorld podcast, Sarah and I got to discuss the first 10 episodes of Stargate Universe's first season. So that would be from Air Part 1 to the mid-season finale, Justice, which left us in a bit of a predicament on a bit of a cliffhanger and with a bit of a surprise uh, in terms of the character interactions and the main storylines of Destiny. So we're going to pick that up uh, right away with the explosive uh, mid-season premiere of Stargate Universe's first season called Space. But first, a few announcements. First up, Calma 2.0, the sophomore outing of a brand new Stargate convention taking place in the UK, has updated its guest list to include over a half a dozen new Stargate personalities appearing September 6th through 8th at the Telford Central Hotel in Telford, England. Previously announced was Sue Ann Braun, who played Hathor in SG-1. She was going to host Kalma 2.0 and appear at the convention in a guest capacity, alongside Kate Hewlett, who played uh, Jeannie Miller in Stargate Atlantis. But now we have a ton more names. Rachel Luttrell, Peter Williams, David DeLuise, Alexis Cruz, Vanessa Angel, and Musetta Vonder will all be appearing this September uh, of 2019 in Telford, England at the Telford Central Hotel. So if this is of interest or you want more more information, the news article on our website has a link to uh, FDC Events Facebook page and also to Ticket Taylor where you can purchase your tickets for the convention. Next up, and very relevant to our main discussion, Stargate Universe is now available to stream in full to Amazon Prime subscribers living inside the United States. Also available to stream for Prime subscribers is Stargate SG-1, Stargate the Ark of Truth, Stargate Continuum, and Stargate Origins Catherine. Again, while this is only for United States subscribers, this is an incredible chance for fans who maybe don't have a Stargate Command membership or don't have the DVDs to go back and binge watch some of Stargate's finest seasons and also to enjoy the Brad Wright era Stargate movies and the most recent iteration of the Stargate franchise, Stargate Origins Catherine. And last but certainly not least, we have a fantastic new piece on the website called Stargate Ethics, Making the Moral Choice in Between Two Fires. This is the debut piece for a brand new GateWorld contributor, Rachel Lulich. Uh, Welcome to the family, Rachel. And it's an incredible and sharp analysis of specifically the moral quandaries that come up in between two fires, but also a brief overview and analysis of how Stargate SG-1 has presented ethics and morality in an interesting light consistently throughout the show's run. And, And I really can't wait for people to read it because it's an absolutely fantastic and sharp, thought-provoking piece. And we're always, always, always excited to have new fans contributing to the website. So again, just like Sarah Kehoe, who responded to uh, Darren's call for new contributors last year, and, and now Rachel, who has delivered a fantastic article this month, we would absolutely love to have new voices on the site. And if you have an idea for an article or maybe an ongoing column you would like to write, uh, please, please, please do not hesitate to reach out to us on Twitter or Facebook or perhaps at webmaster at gateworld.net. Once again, all those items have been published on the site in the last week or two, so if you want to go ahead and read these articles, look for the links in the show notes for the podcast or go to www.gateworld.net and look for any of the recent postings. And now we pick up where we left off last time, discussing the first season of Stargate Universe. The main discussion. So fast forwarding the five months then to space, how did space resolve or continue the story for you? Because it continues the plot threads of justice and the central conflict of justice, but it also introduces our first alien race or truly humanoid alien race um, that will be recurring moving forward and, and continues the story, but in a totally different direction using a totally different mechanism of action. This is 
kind of for me where it this is the first episode that it was a stargatey kind of episode because we had the aliens that we have to figure out what's going on with them. This is something that, you know, I kept expecting to happen earlier in the season. And having completed the season, I'm kind of glad that they didn't. I think it was a great thing to keep in their back pocket for a while. Um, I was not expecting Rush to show up when <laughs> when Young you know, accidentally transports himself to the uh, the alien spaceship. I was not at all expecting to find Rush there and to get him back so quickly, but to get him back... I guess subtle is not really the word, but the fact that they don't absolutely sit down and take your hands and say, okay, so what happened after we left Rush on the planet? He was in this spaceship and here's what happened. They're just like, you're smart enough to figure this out. It was their spaceship that he was on. Now they have him. Let's go. And that's something Stargate always does well. Yeah, and they could have easily done a castaway type episode where it's like we just cut to Rush for half the episode or we, or we tell his story of how he got onto the ship. But I think to your point, this plays way better to a sense of surprise and it's a worthwhile twist and something that was needed to keep the action going. I feel like because the first half as great as it is was really slow, we needed this kind of story beat just to say, look, here's what happened. The rest is common sense. Fill it in yourself in a, in a sense. Yeah. And the kind of just the one, two punch of, Oh wait, hang on. There's aliens out here. Like, Oh, there is life out here. And then also here's rush. But then also we don't know how we accidentally swapped bodies with these aliens to begin with. And, you know, pushing forward from that, the aliens keep coming back and keep popping up in ways that we're not entirely sure how they even know that we're here, much less specifically where here is, I thought was great. I wasn't a fan of the actual CGI rendering of the aliens. And, you know, SG-1, um, Atlantis, I'm also a big Doctor Who fan, so they do it too. They've made me a big fan of the practical effects which aren't always inherently cheaper than going digital. And for the time period, I think they did a really good job with these guys. I just, it almost took it out of, this isn't, not only is this not Stargate, because it's not some guy in a rubber mask, but it's, you know, also not this style of sci-fi that I've come to assume I'm getting. Um but the concept of the aliens I was down with and the overall environment of the aliens and the weird, you know, Aquaman water pods. I loved all of that. Genuinely, the only thing I didn't like was the actual visual of the alien race themselves. Interesting. Yeah. I think at the time I was like, whoa, this is such a cool design. These are, these are the kinds of renders or these are the kinds of character designs that we only see in feature films because those are the only uh, narrative properties that have the budget to make a creature like this. But again, nine, ten years later, the renders, I don't know if they hold up as well as as they should. I, I mean, they're going to appear f in the future. So did, did you get used to it at all or was that did it bother you going on? Yeah, I... I definitely got used to it, you know, as they kept coming back, but the, it, it was a jarring thing. And I think it was you know almost as jarring as the first five seconds of the entire series where people are just flying out of a Stargate. It's, you know, we know how to walk through these now and the aliens are guys in rubber masks or, you know, fairly detailed, just regular old makeup. Um, but either way, we are a long way from the, you know, Jim Henson horse costume from the Stargate movie. Um, that that was a special kind of terrible. But yeah, yeah. It's, I can't even w imagine what the next Stargate's going to look like knowing how far technology has come and also how TV budgets are, are continuing to grow and, and studios are giving more money to shows to really uh, capitalize on their own potential. So we'll see. Yeah, and you're getting, at least from an outsider perspective, because I'm nowhere near involved in actual TV production, but it feels like at least there's less guys, you know, in a business suit sitting behind a computer trying to tell the com creative people how to do their jobs. They're just kind of letting the creative people be creative these days. Yeah, absolutely. And hey, when you trust the writers, good things happen. What can, what can we say? <laughs> trust a writer to tell a story? How <laughs> new wave are you? 
So speaking of space, I'd love to get your take on another uh, recurring device in SGU, another divisive recurring device in SGU, which uh, is the musical montages. And and like the communication stones, it was something uh, that seemed pretty new to fans and, and maybe uh, something people didn't connect with. So, uh, you know, just in the context of season one, both before and after space, how did you feel about those montages as a storytelling device? I think, and you know, a big part of it is watching it through a you know a lens of someone here in 2018 at the time when I was watching the episodes. I honestly and truly did not notice the musical montages <laughs> until um, in life the opening scenes to life happened to be set to a Floggy Molly song, and Floggy Molly is one of my favorite bands of all time. And that's when it suddenly clicked that they're doing montages on this show that they didn't do in the other ones for the most part. So to me, because of that, I feel like they're done very well. They're done very cleanly because truly didn't notice them until I recognized a song. Um, I think, you know, maybe back then when they were first coming out and people were still, I would assume, pretty strongly trying to make this quote unquote their Stargate it would have been a little weird because I think at that point, musical montages in television weren't as common as we're seeing them now. But you have this big of a cast of reoccurring, if not main characters, and everyone's got their favorites. Every fan wants to know what their character's doing. And in those cases, a montage is a great way to do a quick little jump into, you know, everyone's mindsets. Where are you right now? What What is this person thinking right now? And when done right, which I really do feel like they did them right here, they just kind of set the tone for everything that's going on. And then you can jump into the story, you know, especially, you know, a jump from one type of story to the next, you know, from time, which was just a completely gloriously confusing mind twister and then life which was the flogging molly one having you know seen how everyone has reacted to what just happened in our last episode we catch up with them real quick and then we move on uh, without having to sit down and everyone share their feelings to a kino which sometimes will work but that's not always the best option to keep your mo- your story going i feel like in in a lot of shows in, in the past times, writers would have characters monologue, and, and it would be, it would be like that was the only way they could let the audience know uh, how the characters were feeling and be absolutely sure the audience knew every detail of how the characters were feeling. Whereas with a musical montage, boils down to the most essential nonverbal visual storytelling. I think SGU played with with voyeurism as a theme. You know, between the the Kino Diaries, between you know having Kinos flying around on the Destiny. Uh, and then also through implementing montages, you're, like you said, you're getting snapshots. You don't need monologues. You just need a few seconds and then the audience is allowed to interpret it uh, in their own way. And it's, it's something that, I mean, I would have to go back and watch all of season one again, specifically for this reason. But I wonder how much of it was done to set the tone from one episode to the next to make that jump of okay, we just went from this. The ramifications of this is everyone's in a very somber mood. Everyone's kind of trying to, you know, find their inner peace. They're trying to find, you know, maybe something that's getting them excited and kind of giving them their reason to live again. And music is a beautiful way to set the tone for anything. And, you know, pop music or popular, not to be specific pop, but is a kind of a universal way of handling it. It's also a really good way of reminding us that, you know, SGU is still modern day. It's still happening, you know, in outer space right now while you're at home, you know, cooking dinner, doing your homework, checking your email for work. It's all happening right now. And kind of pushing that to remind you of where you are in time, not and not just in space. Yeah. <laughs> what a great pun. What a great double pun. I love that. So um, as as 
the second half of the first season evolves, we start to see more definite physical threats, not just characters having quarrels within the destiny and you know we're, we're we're looking to external threats more than internal threats and and with that i personally felt like the show took on a different tone i mean i mean season one is a, a great season of television but it also distinctly feels like two halves to me whereas if i look at atlanta season one or sg1 season one it it feels pretty tonally assim assimilated through and through. Did you feel the same way? Or what were your general insights into season 1.5? I, I think this is definitely where universe really hits their stride and really figures out what they are as a show. Um, and already I'm not even done with season two. I actually haven't even started season two because I wanted to be as like clear minded about this when I recorded with you. But in TV shows these days can take, you know, two to three seasons before they really hit their stride, but they're given that chance depending on what network they're on. Yeah. And I'm already starting to kind of fall into the camp where I'm like, I don't even know what happens in the next season, but it got cut off too soon. Like they weren't given their chance. And I'm not horribly going to be surprised if, you know, by the time I finish season two, if I'm already in that, like group over around the campfire with our little picket sign saying give SGU a chance <laughs> because they you know took a few episodes to figure themselves out and the fact that they only took half a season to really hit their stride but that half season where they hadn't hit their stride they were still doing really well um you know it's not brilliant straight out of the gate but it's engaging straight out of the gate and a lot of shows don't do that they get a much longer run on traditional network television yeah, I mean, sadly, when it comes to the live viewership, SGU lost like 30 to 40 percent of its viewers by the time it got into late season one. I mean, there was one episode, uh, Incursion Part One, th that the live viewership was like half of what the premiere was. So if you lose half of your live audience between the first episode and the 20th episode, uh, you're in trouble. And whether or not <laughs> Incursion was really good, which I think it was, I think it was too late to recover from its stumble. And that was in the era of live TV where live viewership was everything. If the network can't make money off the new airings, then they're just going to stop uh, committing to a licensing fee. And then uh, your financing infrastructure is going to fall apart and the show is going to get canceled, which is what happened in season two. So yeah, it is a little bit of a travesty. Uh, I think SGU was kind of cursed by uh, an old model of, of television financing that quickly went out of style after it went off air. Um, but it is what it is, and I will say that I think season two still ends with with some kind of satisfactory conclusion, even though the plan for this show was to have five seasons, and at the very least, they needed three seasons to tell their whole story that they had planned from the beginning, and, and also they needed to know if the third season was their last season so they could pack in all the uh, story beats. Well, and you know, two a decade ago... I was amongst a very small group of people that didn't have television. All I had was this newfangled Netflix thing. And so Hollywood slash Vancouver Hollywood as a whole didn't entirely know what to make of this new piece of competition that people were flocking to in droves. They hadn't rectified how to compete against it. Yeah, it was like it was too late for SGU to be a successful cable show, and it was too early for SGU to be a successful streaming show. So it, it kind of got at the raw end of both deals. So as the final 10 episodes ramp up past space and, and divided, were there any stories that you liked, anything you thought stood out, you know, any moments where, uh, that you can point to where you said, yeah, that's, that's a great example of SGU hitting its stride, or that's a great example of the show doing what it does best. And, and just what are your, kind of your scattered highlights and maybe even some parts you didn't like about these last 10 episodes? I, I really, you know, because this is where SGU hit its stride, I kind of went nuts at this point. <laughs> I, I had a day where the weather was really bad and I wasn't about to drive two hours to work. So I called in and I sat down with SGU and a bottle of wine and I watched like two discs straight in a row 
because I got so into, I loved the civilians versus the military, which, you know, they started out with injustice and Young was trying really hard to prevent that from becoming a problem. And of course it very quickly became a problem and you have Rush and Chloe and uh, Camille, you know, kind of putting together this coup of other civilians and they, they were the ones who decided it's us against the military and how that plays throughout really the rest of the season was really, really interesting. I loved how it played out in faith with certain people being like, you know what? We're not entirely sure about this planet, but it's good enough for us. We're done. We're out. And the only reason, you know, they end up going back is because, you know, Young dug in his heels. He was almost kind of ready to let the civilians stay. But when, of course, um, Scott and Johansson were like, okay, no, we're going to stay too because we're going to help these people. That's when Young reacted and forced them back in. Of course, that's when we find out about uh, TJ being pregnant. And, you know, I know it's always one of those. They write it in because typically the actress is pregnant and you can't hide it in this style of a show. But because we've known about this affair um, yeah. <laughs> love triangle quadrangle thing with young and telford and you know emily young and tj that you know threw a really interesting wrench into it and almost pulls her out of the military side of the military versus civilians situation and i kind of just loved pulling all that through and how you know i know we're going to talk about the finale here in a second but that it took a huge shakeup in their, you know, somewhat calm life to get them to come back together. You know, they straight up Brady Bunch, you know, split the ship down the middle for a while. <laughs> and, you know, all that became really interesting. And Eli being torn and Chloe being torn and they're, you know, going on different sides of the duct tape line down the center of the ship pulled in some really interesting character developments Something else I really loved about the the final in or the final kind of half of the season, and something that SGU does really well is their, the taking of the risks and having um, Amanda, whose last name I can't think of, but she's quadriplegic scientist, and they were willing to try that out and go there and take something that most shows wouldn't, you know, touch because we might, you know offend a group of people they're like we're gonna do it we're just gonna do it respectfully we're gonna take that risk and the almost just basically that's what it is the risks they were willing to take with their storytelling and where they're moving their characters was what really drew me in to the last half of the season yeah that that arc with amanda perry and sabotage was really controversial at the time Uh, that episode also had the misfortune of its casting call being leaked to the internet so this whole story arc or in her character journey was boiled down to three lines and on paper it looked highly offensive and insensitive and insane and in a show that was already kind of going boldly where Stargate had never gone before to the chagrin of many, many fans, this was like, okay, this is the final straw. Like the writers have lost their darn mind. Um, I, I, at the time, I, I was just so young when this episode aired, when Sabotage aired, I couldn't, I, I didn't quite know how to feel about it. I just didn't have enough life experience. Like it is a very adult uh, story. You have to know about just just the nature of, of what it would be like for someone to have that condition and also be body swapping. It's it, I'm even just feeling sensitive talking about it now yeah. because it is it is it is really something that I don't think most writers would be comfortable covering in a short TV episode. Again, it's it's just SGU solidifying its identity as as a show that's going to go there whether it stumbles or not. And, and in a way, I really like. I really admire it. I mean, there are times where I don't think it pulled off what it tried to do. In fact, I think it did embarrass itself. And I hear, I mean, SGU is my favorite show, but I'm happy to say that there were plenty of times where the show embarrassed itself and didn't quite land. But y- you got to admire the the chutzpah. Yeah, well, and the having Amanda Perry show up, you know, two episodes after Human, where you find out Rush's backstory with his wife, Gloria, dying, you know, in front of him. Um, and kind of, it makes you almost feel for Rush. And I can definitely see the controversy of using a character with a disability as a device to 
you know, yeah. further the character development of, you know, the straight white guy. Um, you know, definitely in this day and age, it would be very controversial and it's kind of social justice warrior of me to say, but I actually really like knowing that it was, you know, controversial 10 years ago too. But the, just the idea that they're willing to try it, whether or not they succeeded, they tried to do something really bold like that. Um, you know, you have the cancer story, you have Eli's mother, um, and her, you know, health issue backstory. And none of those are, you know, simple run of the mill stories that they were, you know, just kind of glossing over. Um, they don't maybe necessarily explore them as much, but they were willing to try something bigger than, you know, kind of quietly, you know, murmuring in the corner about somebody having a health issue and what happened to them or and how it affects them was really kind of cool to see. And, and it really affected our main characters as well. You know, uh, Rush experiencing um, the death of his wife again through through a memory slash simulation of destinies um, and, and, and characters even checking in with their loved ones back on Earth. It contributes to these characters being more well-rounded while still honoring the sanctity of the characters who are struggling. You know, they're not just archetypes, they're not just a device. They feel like people, even though they also instigate change or a altered emotional state in our characters. Yeah, and one of the things I've kind of not been a fan of that SGU is doing, um, but it does speak to, you know, letting these characters do stuff is all the love triangles that are going, or all of them, there's two of them, but it feels like there's so many <laughs> compared to what you're used to with other Stargates. And when um, James walks in on Chloe and Scott, after, of course, that's how we're introduced to James in the very beginning of the series is she's hooking up with Scott the fact that she never visibly freaks out. She doesn't throw a fit. She doesn't become the scorned woman. She just kind of locks it down, goes in full professional mode. Um, that really made me impressed with James as a character coming through. Before that, she was just kind of, okay, so she's, you know, the military woman. She's, you know, got it. She's good at what she does. And also she sometimes sleeps with some of the guys, but for her to not, you know, become the torn down emotional woman and, you know, Chloe's not tripping all over herself, trying to make amends and make sure they're still best friends, braiding each other's hair, you know, it was really nice to see. But, you know, every time there's, you know, some random sex scene in the middle of the episode, all I think of is the 200th episode of Stargate with, we're going to make them younger. We're going to make them sexier. And every single time, that's exactly what pops into my brain. I'm like, okay, so here we're younger and sexier. All right. Got it. Got it. Um, Cause that was one of the things I loved about the other Stargates was that the love stories were for the most part, very quiet and subtle and just heavily implied in the background yeah, so subtle that in one of the cases, it literally never happened. So Yeah, it only happened in an alternate timeline. Ah, uh, kill me. <laughs> so let's go ahead and dig into the final three episodes of the first season, uh, that being Subversion and then Incursion Parts 1 and 2. This was a more action-heavy, conspiracy-centric invasion thriller three-part extravaganza and at the time i don't know if i liked the lucian alliance being the villain or being the threat especially after getting the nakai like we got in the episode space and getting um some very bizarre alien creatures in the first season i, I thought it was kind of strange that we revert back to leather clad humans um, especially a organization or essentially a gang that we know from the later seasons of SG-1 who were rather primitive and, and not a huge threat at the time. And now all of a sudden it's like we're, we're at their mercy. I know you, you mentioned in the column that Earth really gets their ass kicked. I mean, the Tari really uh, do not hold up well in this three-part episode. Um, so, so just first off, what did you think of this story arc? And off the bat, was it something you were interested in? When they brought in the Lucian Alliance for this, 
I had honestly completely forgotten that the Lucian Alliance was the actual reason they're on the Destiny to begin with. I had gotten so caught up in the character drama of the rest of the series that when they brought in the Lucian Alliance, it genuinely took me a few minutes to figure out why we cared about them at all. Um, But I did like the kind of spy thriller aspect of it. And, you know, I kind of viewed it as a three part story. You know, when watching it, you started with a three part story with air. You kind of end with this three part story here. And once I kind of remembered that they have managed to become a threat because you know, SG one, it was the big threat was the Ori, and then, Oh yeah, there's these Lucian Alliance people. Um, so to have them come in being the big bad threw me off a little bit, but I do kind of like the concept that we're the reason they're there because if it weren't for, you know, rush yet again, thinking he's smarter than everybody else, the Lucian Alliance wouldn't have been able to show up on the destiny and, kick our asses the way they did. So, you know, a lot of the Stargate problems, um, as far as the conflicts that the characters within the shows have to deal with, a lot of the time it's something we bring on ourselves. Like, if we just kept our mouth shut and stayed out of the way, none of this would have ever happened. Um, And so I liked that callback to kind of how the whole franchise started. Yeah, well, I think it's the second time our characters are at the mercy of Rush's hubris. The first time is in Air Part One, or in the in the in the Air pilot, because it's told non-linearly, where Rush basically says, "Yeah, we're going to Destiny because I want to. This is my pet project, and I'm willing to put the uh, put the safety and well-being of everyone on this base in peril simply because I want to go see where this ninth Chevron leads." and he locks everyone out of the dialing program and, and everyone has to go. And now here we are in subversion where he goes rogue again because he wants to follow, uh, you know, he's having this dream about Telford being a spy. So he said, let me switch bodies with Telford and, and, and use that as a cover to go investigate. And once again, he lands himself in a situation that, uh, where he is used and it puts everyone at risk. Um, that's really frustrating. I can see why everyone hates him by now. And, and it's funny at the time I was so innocent watching the show. I was like, well, Rush isn't that bad, is he? And now I watch it and I'm like, this guy's awful. This guy is pond scum. I just, I, I, I hate how much damage he inflicts on everyone else just because of his own instability. He just wants to be able to say he's right. Yeah. And oh, yeah. reality has nothing to do with it as long as at the end of the day he can say he's right. And yeah, as a character, it makes total sense that he pulls off, you know, stuff like this or attempts to pull off stuff like this. And, you know, by the, you know, end of subversion and we're getting into incursion parts one and two, I was totally sold on the alliance being a threat. Okay, cool. I, I was... You know, they had us outnumbered, they had us outgunned, they had us outsmarted for a long time. Um, One thing that really threw me off, though, in Subversion was the use of O'Neill and Jackson. It all felt so hugely out of character that I almost prefer that two of my favorite characters from this entire (laughs) franchise, I almost prefer that they hadn't been in there. Because... Young doing what he did, Greer doing what he did, all that makes perfect sense when they're dealing with Telford. We're going to physically beat the crap out of you, and then we're going to nearly kill you and possibly maybe actually kill you. In Rush's body, so it could be like a double homicide. (laughs) Yeah, like all of that made perfect sense for the two of them. But for, you know, O'Neill to, you know, be standing there going, yep, okay, and just walking away was very... And honestly, every time O'Neill shows up in-universe, it's... Like um, the Kurt Russell O'Neill with one L. He's just very cold and calculated and all the warmth and humor that that second L brings in is gone. Um, (laughs) Daniel pulls out his best Jessica Jones impression, which is the kid's never been known to be able to sneak or not open his mouth, much less sneak while not opening his mouth at the same time. So, you know, Sam was really the only SG-1 character that I felt was in character when she showed up, you know, and yeah, it was just kind of at the very, very beginning, but she was the only one that stayed in character for me. Everyone else was this weird departure. 
They could have used Cameron Mitchell in the place of Jackson or Cameron Mitchell and Teal. Wouldn't that might have worked better, right? I mean, because those are characters with a military background. I would have bought Mitchell running around playing Private Eye at the drop of a hat. I would have never questioned that. Um, it would have made. I mean, I would have even trusted Vala to do it more than. <laughs> You know, our resident, I know everything, and I don't always want to follow military orders, Dr. Jackson. Like, it was just the worst possible character to pick. And he's my baby. He's my favorite of everybody. But I'm like, I don't I don't need you there. Go back to doing your, you know, almost the Captain America. So you've landed yourself in detention videos. That I thought that stuff was a perfect use of Daniel Jackson out in the very beginning. His training videos which were brilliantly terrible workplace training videos it's one of like my favorite stargate cameos where a character appears in a show that they're not a regular in but just quickly slots in and and leaves you with a funny punchline and it moves on yeah so if we kind of fast forward into incursion one and two there's a lot of of twists and turns uh, the Lucian Alliance get the upper hand. The Tar they make a mistake. The Tari gets the upper hand. They make a mistake, and we're left in a pretty, pretty dark final montage. Not scored to a pop song, but scored with one of Joel Goldsmith's beautiful or many beautiful pieces of music that he uh, created for the show. And it's, it's, it's an incredibly dour ending. I mean, it reminds me a bit of like infinity war, the, the new Marvel, the new Avengers <laughs> movie where you leave the theater, you just feel like you've been beaten and bruised and you're like, it's just down. I don't feel so good. Colonel young. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. I mean, did that, you know, this is really, the chance for universe to wrap up its first season and make it feel whole and also get the viewer anticipated for the second season. And with you, you have the luxury of saying, Hmm, okay. You know, do I want to pop in the season two DVD or am I okay? You know, do I not need to watch this for a few weeks or uh, I don't really need to watch this again? You know, it's fine. That was great. You know, maybe it, it doesn't give you that, hunger for for more universe stories so where did the show leave you and especially given the fact that you haven't seen the second season what are your thoughts moving forward and, and what do you feel about where season two can go i i did take a break after finishing incursion part two not because i wasn't interested in what was happening not because i didn't want to know but I truly needed like a minute to stop and sit down and really take in like what the heck just happened. <laughs> and, you know, I I felt that way about, you know, air one through three. So as bookends of the first season, I feel like they really mirror themselves beautifully. And, you know, Telford, you know, is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? Is he actually part of the alliance? Was he brainwashed? Now that he's not brainwashed, whose side is he on? You know, for a character that was kind of just constantly the one who was trying to take over and wanted Young, you know, kicked out of command, you know, suddenly his suddenly his loyalty was so important to at least most of the heroes or most of the main characters of the story surviving. And, you know, the those last few minutes where it's, you know, TJ shot and she's bleeding and Telford's down and Kiva's down and Nobody knows, you know, who's in charge and who's got the upper hand right now really left me. And I think your Infinity War analogy is exactly right. It just left me in this moment where I'm like, what do I do? How do I handle this? Where am I going with my life? <laughs> yeah, it's a bit existentialist. Like, like, even though there's a lot of running and gunning, and it's one of the first times we've got that in universe, and in some ways it's reminiscent of what we got in SG-1 and even Atlantis with the Wraith, at the same time, it's it's deeply psychological, the drama. The, the, some of the things Kiva does are, are are deranged and merciless, and and some of the deaths in this episode are, are, are heartbreaking, and it, it just gets more and more and more tense towards the end. And then TJ, who's pregnant, gets shot. And I mean, that's, again, no spoilers on that, but just in that moment, it's like, oh, that's, that's sickening. That's just... It's, uh, it's can't end well, you know? Well, and, you know, they were brave enough to shoot the pregnant lady. You know, usually pregnant ladies are on this pedestal of you can't touch them. But I absolutely was 
pulled into the story they were telling. I, I definitely got to a point where I couldn't even pay attention to taking notes or developing full thoughts because I was so just, you know, it's close quarters battle. We're not shooting, you know, laser weapons across a whole valley towards someone else who's shooting a laser weapon across the valley at us. You know, we're all, you know, four feet away from each other and we're not sure who's on which side because everyone looks like a human. And, you know, as bodies hit the floor, as the viewer, you're not even entirely sure who all's getting shot half the time. When Kiva got shot, I thought it was one of our people for a few minutes. It took me a second to realize, I'm like, oh, no, it's a bad guy. I'm okay with that. She can go. That's good. That's fine. We want that. I thought that it would end with Telford killing her. You know, the, the traditional Stargate route was like, oh, you know, they both drew their weapons at the same time. But of course, the bad guy is going to get shot. Not not one of our series regulars. You know, not Lou, Lou Diamond Phillips. I mean, come on. But it, it pulled that move. And I think that's a great point to illustrate one of the themes that we've discussed, which is SGU consistently subverting expectations and breaking new ground while still telling quality stories and with with compelling characters. At least that's where I'm coming from. Look, I like the show. I'm sorry. I can't help but geeking out. You're not allowed to like things that you like. I'm sorry. <laughs> right. It's 2019. I should know. But yeah, I do love just how, you know, this is like the ninth time I've said it, but how much they're willing to try something outside of the box. It's not maybe very far away from the box, but, you know, it's still on the outer shell of something that we're just all so very, very used to for storytelling tropes. And to, you know, kill off someone who we just found out was a good guy, or assuming he dies, because heck if I know if he dies or not, you know, shooting the pregnant lady, the bad guys are actually smarter than the, you know, objectively smartest person we've got. Yeah. Um, And, you know, you have to rely on somebody that, you know, is going to sell you out at the drop of a hat if it's going to put five bucks in his pocket is so just true. Yeah. And if he can say he's right while putting that five bucks in his pocket, all the better for Rush. I think uh, in, in your column, you said, uh, I got the quote here, Rush is like all the worst parts of McKay with none of the redeeming qualities and adorable quirks. And and that sentence resonated with me on a spiritual level. <laughs> <laughs> He's gleeful in his own depra depravity. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah. it's, it's strange to watch sometimes. He's McKay from the very first, like the very first McKay episode in SG-1, <laughs> yeah. where everyone wants to kill him because he's so condescending to Carter. That That's all Rush is. And then he takes it to the dark side, which, you know, major credit, honestly, to all of the actors on this show. I know a lot of them, you know, to general pop culture, Lou Diamond Phillips, Ming Na Wen are these go to names for stuff. But everyone, there's not a clunker in the bunch as far as any of your reoccurring, you know, featured everyone's just awesome at what they're doing and you never really know who's going to become the next big character in the next episode because of that so looking back at the first season as a whole if you had to describe it to someone in in you know 60 to 90 seconds if someone said yeah you know what, what was the first season of the show like how would you describe it and i i'd rather ask this than say like numerically what would you rate it or how does it compare to to past seasons of stargate but but rather how would you describe the season to a, a someone who's inquisitive about the show it's a dark psychological character-based drama that occasionally has aliens and gunfights stargate is something as a fandom that's hard to explain to people without, you know, making it sound like every other show out there when it's so different from them. And then this SGU is so different from the rest of the franchise, but you know, it took a military show that was a every week shoot them up. By the way, we're funny sometimes because we have a bunch of comedians trying to be actors or being actors, I should say. <laughs> Everyone was good. I'm not trying to knock anybody. But you had a lot of actors headlining these shows that came from a comedic background. And this one is just straight up. You have to stop. You have to pay attention. The first few episodes, you got to write down which character is which and why do you feel this way about them. 
and the psychological character drama is what pulls you in on this one, as opposed to the overlying threat of a specific alien species. It's it's a bit higher maintenance than the other shows, isn't it? It's a bit more taxing mentally. And I, I might even hypothesize that's why people checked out quickly, because they're like, if I have to wait week to week and it's this dark and, and you know, it requires this much attention, like maybe they loved the more lighthearted nature of the past shows and this this is a show that you have to almost commit to. You have to commit to paying attention. It's it's good it has a high rewatch value. Like oftentimes you might need to go back and say, well, let me see the episode because there was a lot of moments that are consequential to future stories. And it's something that's very beautiful, but also a deterrent at the same time. Yeah. You have to definitely be in the right headspace to be ready to watch an episode of SGU. You can't just put it on in the background and still get what's going on. You really have to sit down and concentrate on what you're watching. Any, any final thoughts on the season? Anything we missed uh, specifically with characters or plot? I will say I am absolutely convinced that uh, when Franklin sat in the ancient chair, and I know we haven't mentioned the ancient's chair yet, he poofed and he disappeared. And I am convinced he is part of the ship right now. I refuse to admit to a reality where Franklin's consciousness is now not part of the destiny and he's not pulling the strings with the Illusion Alliance. I I don't care what the actual ending is. I'm convinced that's what's going to happen. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just say I think you'll like season two. I think you'll really like season two. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me for this discussion, Sarah. And thanks for coming on the podcast. I know it can be a, a little strange to discuss this versus write it down. I know when I'm writing articles, it's like I can I can self-edit and I can have things ready before I share it with the world, but this is more spontaneous in a certain way. So thank you for doing that. And I hope you'll come back for a second episode once you finish the second season of Universe because we're only halfway through the story right now. And I think uh, some of the questions you have will be answered and will also continue to take turns that you probably... Uh, won't won't see coming, even as someone who's familiar with the first season. Well, if that's an official invitation, I am definitely in for the end of season two. <laughs> awesome. Um, in the meantime, I would highly recommend uh, listeners go back to the very start of Sarah's column. Uh, it's called SGU First Timer. Uh, it's under Sarah Kehoe's profile on GateWorld. You'll see all the articles listed sequentially. If you have the time, start and obviously if you've seen uh, the first season of stargate universe start her column at the beginning and read through it uh you won't be disappointed so that's on the website her article about uh, her convention experience with richard dean anderson is another fantastic piece that's helping keep fandom alive in these times of drought which which we really appreciate you uh contributing and i look forward to having you back in a couple months see you then